guy has a little book right between Zephaniah and Zechariah. And we're going to read Haggai chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. Verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts. Because, my, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. Lord, as we now give our attention to your word, I pray that you would speak to to us and instruct us and give us ears and hearts to receive from you, Lord. Thank you that you continue to speak to us through your word. Thank you that you use these times to speak to us. Oh, Lord, let us not waste these times. Lord, let us be changed as we hear from you. It's for our good and your glory we pray. Amen. Well, it's clear from just a quick read of this passage that we are witnessing a confrontation. How many of you have ever been in a room when there's been a confrontation? It's kind of awkward, isn't it? And intense. And yet, things happen in those moments of confrontation, don't they? God's people had sinned, and the Lord, through the prophet Haggai, is confronting his people about their sin and is calling them to specific action. We learn here about how God relates to his people. We learn that one of the good things that God does for his people is that he confronts us about our sin in order that we might come to our senses, repent, and fulfill the high and holy calling upon our lives. This is one of the good things God does for his people. And God does this not because he needs our help, not because he lacks anything, God does this not because our acceptance in Christ is 
and the forgiveness of our sins lacks anything, but because he seeks our good, and in his wisdom and in his goodness, God seeks to be glorified in and through his people. In other words, the forgiveness of sins is not all that God wants for us. He wants us to fulfill the purpose of our lives. And so although we lack no forgiveness, one of the good things God does in our lives is he confronts us when we sin. Let's consider three main lessons found in this passage that we just read. Number one, we see here that God's people still sin and need to be confronted about their sin. God's people still sin. We've talked about this before, but the Bible is anything but blind. And the Bible nowhere suggests, but everywhere there's an understanding that even as God's people, even as Christians, even as those who have been bought by the blood of Christ and forgiven, we still sin. In fact, you don't have to be a Christian long before you realize that putting your faith in Christ and becoming part of the people of God doesn't suddenly end your battle with sin. Right? I remember being baptized when I was younger and feeling the joy of cleansing and the excitement of the Christian life before me and there I was, dressed in white, soaking wet, smiling on the outside and the inside, surrounded by a church that loved me and was excited, eager to follow Jesus. And in moments like that, you just don't want to spoil it, right? You just hope that you can just continue in that state indefinitely. And I don't remember the specifics of when sin reared its ugly head in my life again, but I know it did, and it did very quickly. It doesn't take long to realize sin continues right in here and all around us. We are not yet free from our warfare with sin. There are so many times in the Christian life when our hearts are inflamed by love for God, when we have our eyes open, when we are thinking clearly, when we see his love for us and his holiness and his awesomeness, and we just want to live our lives wholeheartedly for Christ, only to find that the sin which dwells within us wars against our godly determinations, right? I think of this verse in Galatians. Chapter 5, verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the desire of the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. That's post conversion, that's after you're born again. The Israelites who first returned to the land after the exile, which is the topic of Haggai, the, the historical background which we looked at last week, those Israelites who returned to the land after the exile were eager to put Israel's past behind them. The unfaithfulness, the disobedience in Israel's history, they were eager to put that behind them. You need to realize that most Israelites didn't return to the land right away after the exile. And the ones who went back first were the ones who were the most eager. They were the ones wanting to move on. They were the ones wanting to turn the page. These were godly people who believed in God and wanted to worship God. That's the people that we're dealing with here in Haggai chapter 1. They were excited to serve God by fulfilling the task that he had given them to build the temple. What an honor. What an important work. They were excited to do it. 
But as we saw last week, their zeal faltered in the face of hardship, first because of the hostility of their neighbors, and then because the new Persian king ordered them to stop building the temple. Discouraged and distracted, it became easy for them to justify neglecting the work that God had given them, neglecting their God-given responsibility with excuses that seem very plausible. Look at verse 2. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Seems reasonable, seems plausible. We really want to do it, but it's just not time. Too much opposition, too much difficulty. And we need to make no mistake, the book of Haggai tells us that was sin. That was sin. Brothers and sisters, in our own lives, we can neglect the responsibilities that God has done that God has given us because we start making excuses that seem plausible in our lives as well. And that's sin too. Just neglecting our responsibilities because, oh, this is hard, this is not the time. We sin that way just as they are sinning here. Remember in the book of Acts when the authorities commanded the apostles to stop preaching the gospel, they answered that they must obey God rather than men. And this was a we must obey God rather than men moment for the Israelites. But Israel, they caved to the pressure and failed to obey God rather than men. Notice in verses 1 and 2 that both the people and their leaders were in disobedience. The leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua, are the ones being addressed here. You see that in verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say... The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. The prophet was not the voice of populism. He was not speaking for the people against the powers that be, which is so popular today. He was rather telling those in authority to stop listening to the people. Take leadership. Guide the people to fulfill their god given responsibility. And so we see here in Haggai, and we know this from our own personal experience, that we, the people of God, both our congregations and our leaders can fall, can fail in our calling. Congregations and leaders can stumble and get stuck in sin along the way to our own hurt, and to the hurt of those around us. I mean, real Christian churches can fail. Christian marriages can become mired in bitter fighting and divorce. Christian husbands can fail to love their wives as Christ loved the church and to love their children, and to lead their families. Christian wives can fail to honor and submit to their husbands. Real Christians can succumb to addictions, substance abuse, pornography, and get mired down in these things. Real Christians, zealous Christians, can be taken captive by false ways of thinking, which are taken from the world rather than from God, and cause all kinds of damage. Real Christians can get distracted from what they're supposed to be doing. And, as we see here, real Christians can become apathetic to all of that. Even when we know we're in the wrong, we can be apathetic and say, it's just the way it's going to be. 
And when that happens, we've stopped living for God and we're living for ourselves. And the tragedy of that is that when we do that, when we live for ourselves and not for God, we become less ourselves. We become less what we're made to be and less than what we want to be. This week I read a quote from a brother named Uche Anazur, and he wrote a book called Overcoming Apathy. It's written for Christians. And referring to Christians today, he has this to say, and it's a very thought-provoking quotation. We are captivated by things we don't really care about and are lukewarm to things that, in our heart of hearts, mean the most to us. Isn't that a tragedy? And when that happens, what do we need? Well, we see here in Haggai that we need confrontation. Loving confrontation. Remember that awkward, intense moment that you've been in in a room where things happen? We need leadership. We need the Lord to speak to us, and we need repentance. We need God's gracious help when we're stuck to remember who we are, to rekindle our vision and renew our courage so that we do the great work that he has called us to do despite all obstacles. So that's the first thing here in Haggai. Now, number two, the Lord confronts his sinning people. Not only do we see that God's people sin and need this, but the Lord does this. The Lord does this. He confronts his sinning people. The Lord very specifically, very clearly, and very wisely confronts his sinning people. And we not only see here in our passage that the Lord will confront his sinning people, we also learn here how he usually does it. First of all, let's recognize... This is an important lesson for us as Christian disciples. Let's recognize that God usually uses human messengers to confront us in our sin. God usually uses human messengers to confront us in our sin. So don't sit back and say, well, the Lord hasn't spoken to me in a big booming voice from heaven, you know which is often an excuse. Look at verse 3 again. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. It may be through a pastor preaching the word of God, like in this moment right now. It may be through someone with the gift of prophecy who has a dream about your sin. It may be that. But God also and often confronts us simply through our brothers and our sisters. Which is why it's so important that we're not living these isolated individualistic lives, but we're living as part of the church community as God intended us to live. Look with me at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. And in verse 15... These are the words of Jesus. This is his goodness for us as his people. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Do not underestimate 
those brothers and sisters in your life who confront you about your sin. Thank God for them. If they're speaking the truth, it is Christ himself who is speaking to you. And to reject their words is to reject the Lord and his correction. Christ intends for his people to love and care for one another, we know that, as an act of worship to God and as a witness to the world. A healthy church loves and cares for one another, and not only for our physical needs, but also for our spiritual and moral needs, and gives words of correction as needed. A healthy church sees when someone's stuck, and comes alongside them with words of correction. For some, church discipline is this very scary idea. But 90% of the time, it looks like this organic, congregational care for one another that Jesus is describing here in Matthew 18. When you think of church discipline, think of the congregation, like Jesus said, brother to brother, sister to sister, taking care of each other, getting into each other's lives. And where this is going on in the congregation, where there's humility and correction, confession, repentance, it rarely reaches the final stage where it has to go before the church. That is a healthy church community as God intended it to be. So it really is important that we ask ourselves, how are we doing here at Cache Valley Bible Fellowship with that? And in my own heart, do I realize, do I recognize that God often, usually confronts me through my brothers and my sisters? Secondly, we learn here in Haggai that when the Lord confronts his people who are sinning, he almost always begins with questions. Look at verse 4 and verse 9. This is the first thing Haggai says to the people, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Question. Or look at verse 9. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? By asking questions... God gets his people thinking and noticing things, and he brings things to the surface. God wants us to consider our ways. Notice the repeated command in verses 5 and 7. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You see, God, when he confronts us, he wants us to think. He wants us to consider. He doesn't just want to come and steamroll us with the truth. He confronts us with questions so that we would begin to think and understand and put the dots together ourselves because he's really after our hearts, not just a begrudging submission. And there's a lesson here for us, brothers and sisters, as we confront one another that when we confront one another, we should confront each other gently and we should use questions to help people think about what they're doing rather than just show up in their lives and say, you're doing wrong, stop it, right? And I could tell stories as a pastor of how I've failed in that area and it doesn't work. Now, when God commands us to consider our ways, he wants us to consider two things. And we see them right here. Number one, he wants us to consider the rightness or righteousness of our ways. And two, the consequences of our ways. Look at verse 4 and 9. Here's the first thing. The righteousness of our ways. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? In verse 9, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. In other words, Haggai is 
asking the people to think, is it right to neglect God's house and to leave his house in ruins while we busy ourselves with our own houses? Is that right? He's not talking about consequences here at all. He's just saying, is that right? The temple of God represented the presence of God among his people. It represented the purposes of God for his people and the glory of God among his people before all nations. As long as the temple was in ruins, God's name bore reproach. As long as the temple was in ruins, the purposes of God and the plan of God was at a standstill. And as long as the temple was in ruins, it was like the people of God were saying, the presence of God among us, hmm, it's not that urgent. It's not that much of a big deal. And it's the same today as it was then. Only the temple that we're called to build, according to the New Testament, because we are building a temple, brothers and sisters, the temple that we're called to build is no longer a physical temple, but a spiritual building that still is about the presence of God, the purposes of God, and the glory of God. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is it right for us to neglect the work that God has called us to do, to build the spiritual house of God, and busy ourselves with our own things? Is that right? We need to ask this question. What are we living for? Is it right that we live our lives for ourselves or for God? Ask yourself and answer the question, because it's not a trick question, but we need, to, we need to renew that vision again and again and again, don't we? We need to review that. We need to consider that again. What are we living for? What is your and my highest Priority. Is it our career? Is it our family? Is it our houses? Is it our finances? Our health? Our comfort? Our leisure? Our kids? Our friends? What do our actions reveal? Are we doing what God calls us to do? And are we doing it with the zeal that is appropriate to that responsibility? Let me just read a few verses from the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And there's so many verses that we could consider, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And Paul writes this. Verse 15, excuse me. And Christ died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So if we're living for ourselves, we're living contrary to the purposes of the death of Christ and for God's good will in our lives. It's not right. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Paul writes here, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. But 
even in the New Testament, even in the Christian church, we, like the people in Haggai's day, can get stuck. And look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. Paul writes here, For they all seek their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. That's what's going on in Haggai's time. You're all busying yourselves with your own things, but not the things of Jesus Christ. That was going on in Paul's day. And if that's the case today in our lives, then, brothers and sisters, it's very simple. God's gently and graciously calling you and I, if that's the case, to repent. Now, the Lord also confronts his people by asking them to consider the consequences of their ways. And this is a major aspect here in our passage in Haggai. Look at verses 6 and 9 through 11. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. And verse 9, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Verse 10, therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and on what the ground brings forth on man and beast in all their labors. The irony, the sad irony is that by focusing on themselves, Israel failed to secure the prosperity that they sought for. Just as for us, when we focus on ourselves and neglect God's things, we will not get the life we really want. And as we consider our own ways, and as we, cons as we correct one another, we do that gently with questions, and we ask them, is what you're doing right? And is what you're doing really accomplishing the things that your heart truly wants as a child of God? Now, it's not the case that hardship in life such as what God did for his people here. They were economically depressed. They were in a physical drought. It's not the case that hardship in life like this is always the result of sin, nor that prosperity in life, physical prosperity, is always the result of obedience. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. We've talked a lot about that in the Psalms this summer. Nevertheless, when we're facing affliction in our lives, we ought to stop and consider whether God may be seeking to get our attention, whether there is any specific disobedience in our life which God might be disciplining us for. Now, there may not be, and I'm not here to say that if you're you or I suffer some affliction in our life that's just because of our sin and we never would have suffered if we were just obedient. That's not what I'm saying. But one of the tools God has in his toolbox is affliction if he's disciplining us. And so we want to make sure that our consciences are clear and rule out that possibility in our lives that, yeah, God is disciplining me because I am neglecting something important in my life and specific and he wants to bring my attention to that. God has ways of getting our attention. Whatever it may be, whatever may be the case, the Lord afflicts his people. And when he does, it is actually evidence of his goodness and mercy. He afflicts us to get our attention, to get us to think, and to return us to the path of spiritual health. And I'm sure in this church, we have so many stories of how God used affliction in life 
to open our eyes and to restore us to health. It's not condemnation, but fatherly discipline that is always working for our good and his glory. Now lastly, the third thing we see in this passage in Haggai is that the Lord's confrontations call us to specific action. The Lord's confrontations call us to specific action. Look at verse 8. This will be the, the last verse we consider. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. So here the Lord gives his people a specific command. That's what they are neglecting to do, and this is what they need to do. Very specific. Brothers and sisters, there's a big difference between condemnation and conviction. With conviction, God identifies what is out of place in our life, and he shows us the way forward. The purpose of conviction is our good. The purpose of conviction is our restoration and blessing. But with condemnation, we don't see a way out. We're simply haunted not only by what we've done, but by an overwhelming sense of guilt and shame, and we know we're worthy of death, and, and we feel hopeless. There's no path for restoration. Condemnation and conviction are similar because both make clear that something wrong has been done, but condemnation is the voice of the devil accusing us for the purpose of despair. There's no way out. Conviction is the voice of the Spirit leading sinners to repentance, to faith, and to hope in Christ. And we need to know the difference, because as Christians, we will feel condemnation coming from the devil. We're going to feel conviction from the Holy Spirit, and we need to know how to identify that. And let's make no mistake, when the devil condemns us, he speaks a half-truth, doesn't he? We are, in our sin, and because of our sin, worthy of death. And if it were not for Christ, then all we would have is despair. And the devil is not all wrong in pointing out, you deserve to die. You're a worthless wretch. You've offended God, and that's serious, and that's all true. But he just accuses and accuses, and he doesn't tell us the other side of the story. He doesn't tell us the surprising good news that God loves sinners and that God gave his son to die on the cross for sinners who deserve death. They don't deserve life. Yes, they deserve hell. And yet God, in his grace, his surprising mercy and love, gave his son to die on the cross for us and who rose from the dead. And there is supernatural hope in Christ for you, even if your conscience accuses you, even if the devil points out the truth that you deserve an eternity in hell. There is hope because of Christ. So if we're not yet believers in Christ, the Holy Spirit's conviction in our lives leads us to salvation, instructing us to repent of our self-righteousness and put our faith in Christ. And he will save every person who trusts in him by his grace, apart from works and apart from worthiness. He accomplishes that for us because he loves us. If we are already believers, the conviction of the Holy Spirit leads us to repent of specific sins, to put off the old man and its deeds, and to become in our earthly lives what we already are in Christ. Because remember, God's purpose in our lives is not simply to forgive us, it's to make us his people, to sanctify us, to restore us to be the people that he made us to be. So notice in verse 8, the Lord tells his people what the right motive for their action is. He says, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified. This is still why we as Christians are to obey the Lord. It's not for our salvation. It's not to earn his favor and his forgiveness, but simply because we love God 
for first loving us and knowing his goodness, knowing who he is, we want to do what pleases him and what brings him glory. That's the motive. The Lord wants his people to understand their role in his plan. God wants us to understand our role in his plan and to experience the joy and the privilege of participating with him in his great work and to prioritize the things that really matter and are life-giving. And brothers and sisters, we are being called to the very thing that we all actually want. You don't want to get stuck in sin. You don't want to be captivated by things that you don't really care about, and yet we all too often are. God is calling us and confronting us in his goodness. He is ennobling us by the work he has given, and he's enabling us to live the lives we deep down want to live, lives of meaning and beauty and goodness. So we neglect this to our own herd. And I hope you see and have seen today that it's God's kindness that causes him to confront us and call us out of sin into holiness. This is God's kindness in our lives. So brothers and sisters, let's hear again today the word of the Lord through the prophet Haggai. Consider your ways. I mean, if we don't respond to this passage and do that, then we are missing the whole point of what God is saying here and what he wants to accomplish this morning in us. Consider your ways. I'm asking each and every one of us to consider our ways. And I'm considering my own ways also. And if we are stuck in sin, if you identify sin that has a grip on you, that's controlling you, or maybe just apathy, then let's recognize three things this morning. First of all, as Christians, and I'm speaking only to Christians here, because if you're not a Christian, then your sin actually your sin actually is going to cause wrath to come upon you if you don't put your faith in Jesus. But as Christians, we are fully forgiven and stand righteous in Christ before God. Satan may accuse us, but we can always answer that in Christ there is no condemnation. If you are stuck in sin, if you are struggling with apathy, but you trust in Jesus, I want to remind you this morning, you are accepted in Christ and you are forgiven. Let that inflame your heart with love for God. This is not a message of condemnation. Two, let's remember this. Even though we are God's people, even though we are forgiven, the Lord is committed to our sanctification and renewal. And thus the Lord in his goodness will discipline us and will confront us to get our attention and lead us to repentance because he wants us to be the people that he has made us to be and that's part of the good news. So let's remember that this morning. Let's be aware of that and responsive to that truth. And thirdly, importantly, we need specific practical steps to obey the Lord. Go up to the hills and bring wood. We need specific practical steps in order to obey the Lord. What does that line need to be for you? You know, you'll be able to fill that in specifically. Yes, we're not being called to go up to the hills and bring wood, but what are we being called to do specifically? Obedience is often not glamorous. It often looks like doing the simple, obvious things, like husbands leading your wife and children in family worship. Wives, honoring your husbands. Is there a specific way that you don't do that? 
saying no to a specific temptation and seeking help to overcome it. Coming to church, singing praises, greeting one another, calling up somebody to encourage them, getting involved and using the gifts that God has given you to build up the body of Christ? Is there some specific way God is calling you to serve his congregation? Confronting one another in love and responding to that confrontation with humility. Confessing our sins that need to be confessed. Turning from specific sinful practices. Using our time wisely. Telling others about Jesus and on and on. The point is, you're going to be able to fill in the specifics of that better than I can at this time. But don't think that it's always some exceptional thing. Serving the Lord means each and every one of us doing the obvious things day in and day out. And when we all do our part, over time, something beautiful and bigger than ourselves is brought forth. Something beautiful is built. So praise God that he confronts his people. Praise God that he did it then. And praise God that he continues to do it today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and we praise you this morning for this word. We thank you that you confront your people in love. Lord, we ask that you would take this word and apply it to our hearts. In Jesus' name for our good and your glory. Amen.